Hey, it's Michael, and welcome to another podcast episode. Before I get into today's episode, we wanted to make an offer to you. If you go to firmsconsulting.com, you will see a pop-up or you'll see a place to add in your email address or you can register on the Firms Consulting website. If you register onto that website, you get put into an exclusive list. And what you get in that exclusive list is samples of the content we have available to FC Insiders. For example, you could get a sample episode of Competitive Strategy with Kevin Coyne. Kevin Coyne is an ex-McKinsey partner, former worldwide head of strategy, and he had served something like over 25 CEOs on a personal level, on a one-to-one basis over his career. Kevin also has a program called How to Become a McKinsey Partner. It's the first time ever a McKinsey partner has gone on record talking about what is actually required to become a partner and you'll find it's very different from what you think is required. How to develop deep insights which I've put together one of our most popular programs the electric car startup you will get sample episodes of all of those programs and more if you sign up to this list. So that said I hope you enjoy today's episode. Welcome everyone today I have Jerry Colonna on the line who's going to talk about his very interesting new book called Reboot. Hi Jerry. Hey, Michael, how are you? It's good to be here. Thank you so much. I know it's not often that someone is so committed to the cause that they make time on a Saturday morning. I feel pretty special, Jerry. (laughs) Either that or I don't have a life. (laughs) I'm going to go with it. I feel very special, Jerry. I think that's the right way to do it. Okay, that'll make you feel good. Right, so I've read your book. I spent the whole of Wednesday morning reading it from cover to, from page to page, cover to cover. And... Thank you. You know, generally when a book has pastel colors on the cover, I generally give it a pass, but your book came well <laughs> recommended, well recommended. And, you know, when I was reading the book, I actually went through the book circling the number of times the words burst into crying appeared. You seem to cry a lot, Jerry. I do. <laughs> I mean, I'm starting to wonder whether I you mean, have shares in I Kindle. I sob. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a very interesting book because... I don't know how much you know about myself, but I also do uh, career coaching for senior leaders. And a lot of the things that you speak about, I think, wow, finally someone who understands some of the things I go through. But we're going to get all into all of that in a minute. Maybe it was a start. Just tell me why you wrote this book, because it seems like you're sharing all of your trade secrets here. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you. And second, before the call ends, I want to make sure we talk about your feelings about pastel colors. Okay. (laughs) It's something in my Um, childhood. I read the book. It's from my childhood. Yeah, everything's from our childhood, right? You read the book. Yes. Um, Why did I write the book? I think that maybe one of the ways to answer to that question, if I can expand it a little bit, is why do I do the work that I do? Yeah. Because to me, the, the book is an extension of that. And as you recall in the book... One of the most pivotal moments of my life was this moment when I was about 38 years old at a pinnacle of success outwardly, where people were projecting onto me their definitions of success. Inwardly, I was, as I say, empty and hollow. Quoting St. Augustine, I say, my soul was a burden to me. I had grown weary of the man who carried it. And in that space, I felt disembodied and disconnected from my inner sense of self and my outer actions, that misalignment. So I do the work that I do, and I speak as I do, and I open myself as a model for others who might need from their truest hearts so that I could reach back in time and retroactively save that 38-year-old version of me from the pain that he was going through. Wow. And did it, do you feel that it, was, that it helped? I do think it helps. I think it helps us when those whom we see as having on further on the path of life, whether we see them as elders or mentors or leaders or adults in our lives, if they allow themselves grace to be true and real and authentic and feel all that they feel and lead and speak from that place, then it magically creates the space for those of us who are watching them to do the same and to live in a way and to lead in a way where we are in alignment between the inner and the outer. Speaking about the book for a moment, in this conversation, we're at a point in the process where the book has for several weeks now been out in galley form, Mm -hmm. in corrected proof. Yes. And a number of people have read the book and have sent me photos of their copy of the book, which, and it makes me delighted because all of them are marked up, posted, no 
nodes and highlighted section and dog-eared pages. <laughs> um, and what that says to me is that the book is acting on them. Yes. Uh, they are having a dialogue with the book. And I think that's the first sign of evidence that I earlier wish to sort of help me in the past means that I'm working, yes. meaning that I'm helping those around me. That makes any sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. When I read your book, I was quite interested in it because the model you talk about is, I may be picking my words incorrectly, but I would say authenticity. But at the same time, don't you feel you're almost pushing an uphill battle here because it's almost as if the whole world, from the time we basically can read and write, get to high school, get to university, do an MBA, we trained not to be authentic, to fit in. We trained to be confident and project a some image of ourselves that has nothing to do with what we're really feeling. And then your message comes along, which I completely agree with, by the way. I think it's the only way to lead. It's the only right way to lead. It's the only sustainable way to lead. But do you not feel as if every time you meet a client, they've almost been brainwashed to do things incorrectly and you've got to unteach them these bad skills? You're going to the heart of one of the challenges that exists right now. And the brief answer to your question is, yes, it is a difficult challenge. One of the first things that comes to mind is something you said, where we train ourselves, yeah. in effect, to project confidence. And I hear in your words the truth of what you're saying, but I also hear the falsity of mm -hmm. what you're saying, meaning you're not talking about true confidence. We're talking about assumed confidence. We're talking about a mask. And I think you're right. I think that we train ourselves to, our society asks of us, starting at a very early age, to not be who we really are. And then we ask people, we give them power, we give them agency, we give them authority, mm -hmm. we give them responsibility. We say to them, please solve the world's problems, lead us in some particular way. And then something terrible happens, which is that sort of inner critic voice, that imposter syndrome voice starts getting louder and louder and says, you don't know what you're doing. And it's because we're living behind this mask. We're leading from behind this mm -hmm. mask. And there's a tragedy that ends up resulting. And the tragedy is that people, as I did, feel out of alignment between the inner version of who they are and the outer version of who they are. And then they start to feel terrible themselves and or they begin to act terribly on the world at large. And so, you know how we also, one of these other things that you and I will also battle, because yeah. we do so much work with business leaders, how people might say, well, business, I, I give up on them. You know, they're just horrible capitalists, and yes. they do these horrible things to the world. Why do we do horrible things to the world? I think we do horrible things to the world because we're doing horrible things within ourselves. That's very profound. It's a nice way of looking. It's actually the correct way to look at it. You can't fix the well, symptom you know, until you get to the root cause. Yeah, I mean, you know, we look at our businesses and we say, they're so rapacious, so awful. Look at the way we treat each other. Yes. This pursuit of capitalism, this pursuit of money at all costs, this pursuit, what are we really pursuing? We're pursuing self-optimization at all costs. Then we scratch our heads and we say, it must be because of the form in which we have organized ourselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, hold on here. As my mentor and teacher, Parker Palmer, says, Violence is what we do when we don't know what to do with our stuff. I love that quote. Right. And if you apply this to organizations and communities of power and communities of authority and agency, and we say, why does that business violate basic standards of ethics and morality? But well, let's look at the leaders. What is going on here? Because here's the thing, Michael, if we don't look at the underlying implications mm -hmm of those who hold power not doing their work, we are condemning our current generation and future generations to more of that violent suffering. Yes. You know, I talk about going back in time and retroactively saving myself, but in a sense, I think about a client who came in to see me maybe six or seven years ago. Georgetown undergraduate, Harvard MBA, mm -hmm. pinnacle of his career. And, you know, at 38, he said to me, I have done everything right in my life. Why do I hurt so much? And I can't answer that question mm -hmm. when I'm turning back to this question of how to open your heart, to lead from that broken, open place. Oh, forgive me, your question was profound, and I went off on it. No, 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 you didn't go off at all. In fact, you raised two important points I want to build on. 
And one maybe you haven't talked about in your book, but I think it's a really good point, is that if you look at the way the world is structured today, whether it is startups, I'm talking about the business world, whether it is policing Fortune 500 companies and so on, we say that we're going to bring ethics to the business world by having penalties that are so disastrous that if you break the rules, you're going to go to prison or you're going to be hit with some $5 billion fine. And we hope that that will then cause people to do good for the world. But what you're saying, which I like, is that maybe we can make people more ethical by getting them to understand their reasoning for doing things, which is to me a more sustainable process. Because if you just have penalties in place, as soon as the penalties disappear or there's a perception of lack of enforcement, people just go back to their old behavior unless they rewire in the way they think about things. And I think that there's a whole new way of thinking about ethics. Maybe we're too dependent on penalties because maybe in a sense we're too lazy. I don't want to take the time to understand why we are doing things. I appreciate the point you're making. I'll disagree with one small piece of it. Sure. I actually don't think it's a new way of thinking about it. Yeah. It feels to me, as I hear you reflecting back my own thoughts in this regard and your own interpretation of them, which is beautiful and spot on, what I hear in your words are the fundamental teachings of Buddhism. Buddhism. Well, I never ever called me a Buddhist before, but I'm willing to learn anything new. <laughs> well, here's a basic teaching of the Buddha. Yeah. Human beings are born essentially good. Just hold that thought for a moment. Okay. To me, it's mind-blowing. Human beings are born essentially good. You're not born in sin. But to me, that's intuitively true, right? I mean, a, a child has no sense of discrimination or anything. It's just a nice person. Start even at a baby. Right? Yeah, a baby, yes, a baby. Exactly. And yet, if you think about the traditional view of ethics, and I think you said it so well, it's about a kind of reward and punishment system. If you do something bad, you will be punished. Right? In, from a Buddhist perspective, if you act in a way that is antithetical to aspirational values, there will be suffering. That is true. But suffering is not a punishment. It's not some sickle finger of mm -hmm. an Old Testament God looking down at you and saying, bad boy, bad girl. It's saying you, as a fundamentally, basically good being, will feel terrible as a consequence of this. And so in order to relieve yourself from suffering, you should consider doing well. You should consider doing good things, which you know, in a sense, can sound selfish, except that when we realize that when we alleviate suffering, I alleviate my suffering. As you and I are connected, I alleviate your suffering mm -hmm. and vice versa. And so when we look at that from that very ancient tradition, 4,000-year-old tradition, and we look at ethics from that point of view, then encouraging ethical behavior becomes a matter of encouraging people to be their truest, most authentic self. I hope that the SEC is going to be listening to our podcast as they make up new rules to go after white collar crime in the United States. Because I, I agree with you. I feel that, you know, if you go back to Chinese medical principles, they distinguish between medicine that is preventative and medicine that is reactionary. And I find in the West, we tend to take a view that, yeah, let's make a lot of mistakes. Let's do things wrong, but we'll find some way to fix it after the fact then setting up things in such a way that we are so true to ourselves that we never do something bad in the first place. And I think that's what you're saying. Yeah? If we follow these principles, we will not be seduced or segued into doing the wrong things because we will be true to ourselves. Because as you say, we start off as basically all babies are like a computer that has no bad programming. Right? But we taught these things as we develop. Yes. And I hear you reflect it back. I want to make one distinction. I don't live in a Pollyanna world where I believe human beings, if they could just get in touch with their true self, sure. won't do harmful things. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's true. But I think that if we start to ask ourselves, and forget about others, if we start to ask ourselves, why have I acted in a way that causes harm? Yes. And I drop the notion of myself as being fundamentally broken or evil. Yes. Right? If I start from a place that I am fundamentally good, mm -hmm. and yet there are times in which I have done things that I am not proud of, then the question becomes, well, why did I do those things? And what can I change about myself so that I can move closer to alignment with my inner sense of it? Yeah, I like that. We are all human. Mm -hmm. And when a leader acts 
when the, those who have power act from a place of their shadow, there are parts of themselves that they have disowned. They tend to contribute to suffering, theirs and those around them. What we're trying to do is create businesses, create organizations that are places of flourishing, places of growth and actualization, or as they say in my book, places where mm-hmm. human beings can grow into their best adult self. Yeah. And understanding those moments when we act out of alignment with those values can be quite instructive and liberating. It's far better to understand why I, as a leader, act from a place of pettiness or greediness. It is to necessarily set myself up constantly, feel like crap, by denying that I have those symbols. Yes. Well, it's, it's a process, right? It's about acknowledging where you are and choosing or being open to improving. It's not, it's not as if there's an absolute measure of being ethical or perfect and we, and we all are going to be striving for that metric and point because it's very subjective. You know, what's ethical in one country is not so ethical in another country. But you know, thinking about that point, I was thinking that one day when we invent time machines, we'll put a copy of your book into the capsule and send it back for a teenage Hitler and a teenage Stalin to read. And maybe things wouldn't have turned out so bad. Beautiful image. <laughs> Beautiful image. Now you're going to make me cry. <laughs> well, I do have a box of Kleenex here, but I'm not sure whether I can get it to you. But I, I think Amazon does, uh, you know, 15 minutes of Each book with a, with, a, with a little package of Kleenex. <laughs> well, you know, we actually make jokes about that, but if you think about it, as adults, we are trained not to cry. It's a sign of weakness. And if you show tears... It's as if you've committed career suicide in many cultures and in many companies in the world, even the most progressive companies. So I make jokes about crying, but to me, it's like when you cry, it's the ultimate symbol that you're going to break those strictures that you've been taught to accept and start, maybe not over, but start looking at doing things differently. Right. Let me reflect back that because a lot of people ask me about the whole crying thing. There's this whole separate internet meme about Jerry Colonna is the man who makes people cry. <laughs> and my joke is that I don't really make people cry. I really don't. All I ask them to do is to stop and still feel. Now, I think it's a really interesting observation that when we ask people to stop and stand still and feel, why wouldn't it be laughter and joy? Yeah. I think that's because many of us are living... Did Ralph Waldo Anderson say, the vast majority of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Mm. Behind that rough exterior, that tough exterior that you were talking about, where it would be career suicide to show emotion, there's a majority of people who are living lives of quiet desperation. Just hold that image in your mind or in your heart for a moment. Mm-hmm. And imagine that that woman who's a vice president at a large multinational corporation who, day in and day out, sacrifices time with herself, time with her children, time with her spouse, to live up to the obligation of authority and agency. And there's no space for her to have those feelings. Well, hold that image in your heart. Ask yourself what her children feel. Let's take that in the time machine again, and let's go into the future, and let's ask how those children now that they're adults, they're the leaders of they. So while we often talk about how it's so weak to show emotion, there's something quite brave and quite strong about being able to acknowledge, you said it well before, where are you right now? That happy, tired, where are you right now? That place we make the decision back thousands of people. I can't promise that this is a path to anything other than living in a little bit closer alignment between me. It's not going to move a stock price up. It's not going to change the revenue structure necessarily. I think it may create, I know it creates a gorgeous little sandbox for brilliant people to do the best work of their lives. Listening to this, it made me think back to people that I've developed close relationships with when I was a strategy partner you know, different CEOs, males, females, and so on. And the one thing that I now realize is a pattern here. Well, I've always realized I am close to a client, and not just friendly with them, not they just trust me and the firm, but they personally like me and see me as part of the inner circle when they tell me about their trauma in their life. 
So whether it's uh, the CEO, female CEO of an oil company or the male CEO of an insurance company, what I notice now speaking to you, and you know, you've sort of laid the groundwork for that very well by making me see it, is that it's interesting that we only realize we connect with a human when they share with us their trauma. And it's interesting that when you really become close to every single CEO that I can think about, the first thing they share with you when they realize they can trust you is the pain they have experienced in the world and the pain they are really feeling right now. And once you are open to listening to them, not judging them and just letting them be themselves for a moment because they're under so much pressure not to be themselves, you connect with them and you're a better, I wouldn't say advisor, but you're a better counselor to them and the relationship moves on. And I've never realized that, but it's almost as if to connect with humans, they almost want to share the pain they've been through. And it's a universal thing, whether it's, CEOs in Latin America, Asia, or Europe. I mean, is, is that a universal thing? Or is it just my experience? I think it is quite universal. And let's reframe it a little bit more broadly. What I hear you saying, Michael, and I think it's a really astute observation, is that human hearts are longing to share their stories. When we find a trusted friend who, with whom we can go for a walk shoulder to shoulder, not with one person in an ordinate and subordinate position, right, and the other in a subordinate position. Yes. One person, quote, in front leading and the other person in the back. But shoulder to shoulder, walking side by side, and here is how my heart has been broken. But here is how who I am was shaped by the love and the laughter and the joy and the tears of my life. Here is who I am. And that gets reflected back and accepted. So, Michael, you, who you are, is fully and completely accepted. Even your foibles, even the ways in which you have failed to live up to your values, fully accepted. It doesn't mean I accept the actions. It just means I accept you. If that longing gets met, reach across time and space and differences in culture and ethics and belief systems, find this other human being standing next to them, however they get Whatever gender, whatever story that they carry, two human hearts together. When that happens, this is a community. In the book, it's stories that bind us, where we go back in time to being the tribe, sitting around the fire, telling stories to make sense of a world that is really confusing. Oh, right, I look up across the fire, and there you are. You're not alone. What's interesting about that to me is that, you know, we live in a world that is so obsessed with... Um, rightly obsessed with breaking racial lines, breaking income barriers, whether it's a quota system, whether it's about, you know, we use words like uh, income mobility, it's about uh, redistribution of wealth. But it really comes down to finding a way to accept people for who they are, because that's what all of those concepts are moving towards, right? And I wonder what would the world be like if everyone felt they were accepted for who they are. I mean, would we be able to make them better employees? I think people would be better. I'm forget about being employees, but I think people would be more fulfilled. That's right. If we go back to that Emerson notion of living lives of quiet desperation, how much violence there is in the world, how much corporate malfeasance, how much heartache from the desperation. And if we can be together in community, across power structures, across lines of responsibility, across command and control, hierarchical, organizational structures. If we can be together, if we can roll up our sleeves together and say, let's join together in this enterprise, this magical thing we're trying to do, starting a company, leading an organization, creating a new product or service. If we can be together in that, and it turns the work into a place of community building. Mm. Now think again about what her children might feel yeah. as they watch their mother take her way in the world and not feel depleted, finished, and annihilated by work. Feel uplifted, celebrated. Yeah, we never really think about decisions through the eyes of the people, or well, children of the people, but that's a nice way of framing it because it's very personal. But I do want to switch gears a little bit because there is a common theme you mentioned in the book, which I completely identify with, and you laid out very well. And I want to bring this up because I think it's quite important. You know, I'll tell you a story about a client I had because it's very similar to something you had mentioned several times. I had a client called Andrew. He's mentioned many times on our website and so on. He's quite well known. 
And we were trying to help him become a partner at a major professional services firm. And when he first joined the coaching program, he wanted to know exactly the tools and techniques that a McKinsey or BCG partner would use to analyze a client problem and to structure his or her career so that Andrew could take those tools and just follow them. And I remember pointing out to him that's not the way it works because you first have to figure out who you are and then figure out the right path for you to do what you want to do in the world. And it may not even be being a partner at this firm. It could be something else. And the guy got so angry that he did not come back to me for coaching for six months. Because in his mind, there are these functional tools and techniques and models that I'm withholding from him. And if I just gave it to him, he's going to be this remarkable success. He eventually came back and he did end up being a success, but it was a process of him finding out who he is and then how does he build his career from that. And I noticed that you also talk about that in your book, whereby people get upset when you initially ask them about their childhood. They get upset when they feel you are withholding some magical solution. And that to me resonated because I thought I was the only one experiencing this, but apparently it's quite common. I think it relates to, you know, so I'll respond empathetically to your Mm -hmm. friend. I often remember being frustrated by one of my Buddhist teachers, Ani Pema Chodron. Yeah. You mentioned it in the book several times. Yeah. She altered the path of my life. What was really important to me was that she viscerally demonstrated the pathless path, which is on Shinya Buddhism, that there is no path, or more specifically, that the path is your path alone. And I remember one time, one of our first early boot camps that we, we do, these day immersive experiences that the company runs. And somebody stood up and said, wait, 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 you mean there's no playbook? <laughs> I said there's a playbook. <laughs> I can relate to that. I've heard it many times. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then, you know, like 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 your client Andrew, and like you're you know, you're laughing because they, I imagine you had the same experience. It, it's like they look at you and they say, but you're withholding information yes. from me. Right? And the truth is even those who write a playbook, and there are plenty of people who write books mm-hmm. that are called playbooks, here's how to do it. Mm-hmm. The problem with most of those books is they forget the parenthetical statement that goes along with that, which is, here's how I did it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And those books can be really helpful, but you have to remember, this is not how to do it. This is how they did it. Yes. It's a kind of a memoir in a manner of speaking. It's kind of a memoir. For me, it's why, you know, when I started to write the book, I didn't want to do what I called the finger-wagging kind of book where, you know, these are the five things you must do to be successful. Because the truth is, as brilliant as I might be, I cannot anticipate all of the situations that my clients will encounter. Yes. You can't. You can't. We can't. As consultants, as strategists, as coaches, the thing that we are responsible for doing, just as parents are with their children, what we're responsible for doing is helping them not need us anymore. Oh, I love that statement. That is so brilliant because you want them to be able to operate at their best self even when you are not there. That's right. That's a good coach. A good coach has one goal, to put himself out of your life. That's right. Now, you can be friends. We made wonderful acquaintances with former clients. In fact, two of them are co founders in my company. They themselves went on to become coaches. But the relationship evolves. Mm. And, you know, in my book, I often reference my former psychoanalyst, uh, Dr. Sayers, who was so instrumental in me becoming so instrumental. And the truth is, even though she has passed away, mm-hmm. her voice is still in my head. So I don't need her anymore the way I once needed her. And partially because she's already in me, making me laugh, making me feel, making me see the ways in which I am uh, not living into my best self. And, you know, my hope with something like this book is that people hear the wisdom that I have been given passed on to them and they get to bring it forward and move it forward. Well, I think she'd be very proud to see the impact you're having in the world distilling her teaching and philosophy. And in many ways, the book is an homage to her, right? The book is dedicated both to my three children and to her. 
I mean, that's really the greatest compliment you can give a coach, a mentor, is that you want to share their thinking with the world. So the part that resonated with me a lot is one of the things I teach people, and I'll give you an example, because I live in the world of strategy consulting, so I'm going to use those examples. You know, if you have two partners from you know, two consulting firms, let's say one was born in the former Soviet Union and had no choice their entire life because there's just not a lot of consumer products made. There was just one brand of milk, one brand of orange juice and so on. And then she's working alongside another partner who is from the United States. Both of them are looking at the same set of data is going to come to radically different conclusions because of the way they interpret that data. So the lady from the former Soviet Union, assuming they're both advising a consumer products company, she's going to say, well, you know, why do you need 17 subcategories of orange juice? Why don't you just have five? No one needs 17 subcategories. The American is going to say, well, actually, you need 27 because you've got to value each subsegment of your population. Now, the reason I say this and the reason why I like your books so much is because one of the things that we don't understand or we fail to appreciate when I think when we are young is that there's no tool or technique, there's no right answer, there's no data, especially in Silicon Valley, you know, data rules everything, but it's about how, the way you interpret the data. And the way you interpret the data is judgment. And your judgment is a function of the way you were brought up, the experiences you had, but more importantly, whether you are able to tap into those experiences. So when I deal with people all over the world, I always tell them the most important skill you need is judgment. And everyone tells me, Michael, how do I build judgment? Do I need to read the Wall Street Journal, McKinsey Quarter? And I say, yeah, a little bit. But the most important thing is about judgment is the way you interpret that information. So what are the experiences you've had in your childhood? What are your formative experiences that make you scared of choice? And when I read your book, I realized that maybe in a different way, but you're talking about the same thing, whereby how do we build up our judgment? And I like that. So, you know, in that sense, I definitely would recommend a lot of clients read your book because I feel that by reading the book, they can go on a journey to improve their judgment by understanding where they are. And I've never read another book, even though you don't use the word judgment here, that talks about the importance of judgment the way you have. Have you seen other people become better at the way they make decisions as they go through this journey? I'll answer your question this way. The word that comes to mind in response is, again, a very important Buddhist term which is discernment, discernment, ability to sort of see things as they are and therefore act in accordance with things as they are, not as we wish them to be. Well, I saw this quote I saw this quote in your book, this being so, so what? Is that linked to it, the same concept? That's right. That's my kind of bastardization of an aphorism, which is an important discerning tool or tool of discernment in which I encourage people to sort of acknowledge things the way they are. The company isn't what you want it to be. What will you do about it? The product doesn't work. What will you do about it? The world is a harsh place. What will you do about it? You may not be living the life that you were intended to live. What will you do about it? What I like about that phrase is that there's the, it takes the judgment, as mm. you say, discernment, as I say, and it encourages it an action. You know, in the Eightfold Path of Buddhism, two of the most important notions are right seeing and right action. Yeah. Discern. What's actually going on here? And what will you do about it? And if we take our actions, the full knowledge, complexities and complexes that we carry from our childhood, tendencies, right? I have a tendency to avoid a sense of obligation mm -hmm. because it feels entrapping to me. Mm -hmm. So when I take my seat as CEO, this is all true facts, when I take my seat as CEO, if I don't acknowledge that part of me, I will act from that part of me, thereby creating suffering for my colleagues. If I will jettison responsibility for things or order not to feel obligated, therefore trapped. But if I can lovingly take that back in and laugh at myself and give my space, my colleagues the space to say, oh, Jerry, we're not going to trap you, but we need you to do this, mm -hmm. there's that care and concern. That dialogue, to me, is a beautiful expression of what you're calling judgment. It has wisdom. It has self-care. It has spaciousness in it. Mm -hmm. and it has the, the call to action. 
So if I'm reading this book, right, so I'm looking at it from the perspective of someone who advises people, so I think about the book in that way. But from someone who's just picked up your book, so for example, I'm going to recommend it to some clients. How would they use the book? I can see how I would use the book because I have some of a pre-wired coaching kind of mindset. But someone who doesn't know what they need to do with this, how would they use the book? The thing that occurs to me is something that happened with a dear friend. I, I won't describe the connection because mm-hmm. I will feel who they are. A dear person in my life who's much younger than me is a teacher, public school teacher, not anyone close to startup or business or CEO position or any of that. And they read the book, and you know, at the end of each chapter, I close the chapter with a series of what I call journaling invitations, which are questions to ponder, to write about. And um, this person sent me their journal entries, answers to the questions that I asked. And in doing that journaling, they came to have a completely, profoundly different relationship with their parents. And persons in their early 30s, you know, so you ask, how would a person work with this book? How would they do that? And I think that embedded in that story is exactly where I might approach the book. I share stories in a particular chapter. In the mm-hmm. first chapter, for example, I talk about first about my relationship to money, but ultimately about a number of people's relationships to money, how that relationship to money and, and, and mm-hmm. implicitly the wish for safety forms and shapes, I think the short answer to your question is really what I would hope is that they would use the book as a means, ask themselves probing questions to further their process of growth. That's the whole point of the subtitle, right? You should have been the art of growing up. Mm. Understand that the practice of growing up elbows to all of us, and it's our responsibility. In the book, you speak a lot about your parents, your family. Uh-huh. And... It is clear that everyone is heavily influenced by their parents and their interaction and the nature of their relationship with their parents. It felt to me like you were seeking closure with things that have happened in your past. Is that a correct interpretation? Is that journey influenced the way you have helped other people? Two very important and related questions. So I'll take them in piece. First one is, Note that I was describing the process by which I have come to this level of closure and understanding of my parents. Second was really an exploration of the way in which others mm-hmm. are doing. Am I hearing that right? Yes. So the first answer is yes, very much so. And I think that understanding, for example, my father's struggles in his career, in his relationship to work, has helped me understand my own career choice in very, very profound and important ways. And more than understanding, but understanding something profoundly important is that as flawed as they may have been, my parents did the best they could. Even mm-hmm. as I say that, my body relaxes. My parents did the best they could. There are things that I wish were different, things that I am glad they were exactly the way they were. And by giving myself that sensibility, they did the best they could. The magical thing that happened is I need only do the best that I can. Mm -hmm. I do not have to be perfect. I don't, as Mary Oliver, the poet, says in a brilliant poem, need to walk on my knee miles on end. I have to do the best that I can. I am enough. It releases my parents, it creates a sense of closure, for sure, but it releases me, allows me to actually live and lead from a place of understanding and care for those who might come and seek and need my understanding. By doing all that, I get to live as a leader. Like, why do I fear obligation? Why do I feel being trapped? Mm -hmm. I can look at my father's own past. I don't want to end up being fired in my 50s. The job that I held since I was a high schooler. Yeah. I don't know. Did that answer your question? Yes, and it also got me thinking just about Western culture. I was finding Western culture, we are obsessed with the ranking, sorting, scoring, and finding an answer to everything. And I feel we almost 
I don't think we feel, I think we are doing that with our parents. We want to say, did we have good parents or bad parents? And you know, this an entire cottage industry that's grown out of counseling people in terms of interpreting how their parents have affected them. And similar to you, you say it very well. When people ask about my parents, I just say they did, I think they did the best they could. I don't blame them for anything. I think that they obviously wanted us to be as successful as they could make us. If they could have made us more successful, I'm sure they would have done it. But I feel that we should introduce a third choice for our parents rather than they were good or bad. But the third choice is they did the best they could. And that should be enough rather than spending a large percentage of our lives trying to figure out every meaning behind every word. Because a lot of the things they said when I was growing up, I'm sure there's not a lot of thought that went into it. And we can get so sucked up into it that we don't end up living our lives. I mean, I've seen that with every single client I've had. And if you really dig deep down, they're all either running towards something their parents will give them or running away from something their parents wanted to give them. And it's as if the, the race is over and it's been settled years ago. But in their mind, they are still going through the motions, not realizing that you know time is going to continue and they can decide if they want to run a race in the past or just make peace with it and do something for themselves in the present. And it's almost funny because every client is defined by that. I've never met a client who is so at peace with things that they are able to focus on the present. And then when I read your book, I also get a sense that your clients are also like that. And I wonder, I mean, I know why it happens, but it's almost as if the first step is getting them to understand you don't have to rank your parents. They did their best they could, and you know, that's all you're ever going to know, right? Most of them have parents who have passed away. It's not like you can go back and interrogate them to find out why did you do this? Why did you say that? And I think the process here, what I'm trying to summarize, maybe not in the best way, it's about getting people to forget about something that happened in the past and try to live in the present. I wonder if I'm capturing that in the best way. I think you are. I think you are. And I think that the struggle that people have, it, you've identified two very important struggles that you see with your clients that I also see with mine. And the first is outward-facing, productivity-focused, output focus mm. view of the world, right, that will often lead them to, as we, to circle back to what we were saying before, a kind of projection of a mask of confidence that creates this sort of dissonance. And yet, at the same time, there's this other profoundly important observation that you've made. When we look at our past, and I often encourage people to look at the past, but when we look at the past, we can get stuck. Because we're trying, in effect, to retroactively make it all make sense, right? And we're trying to fix it. And, of course, you can't necessarily retroactively fix things. And so those two points of view, I think, take us out of the action of every day. Yes. They take us out of the, this being so, so what? Mm. One point of view that I often think of is, it is embodied in the Carl Newton quote, which is, I am not what has happened to me. I am what I choose to become. So what we encourage, I think, is an understanding of what has happened to me, an understanding of the way in which what has happened to me has shaped my views of the world so that I can then choose the views of the world that I wish to carry forward, so that I can then choose what kind of company do I want to work for, what kind of company I want to build, is the kind of company I want to build is the kind of company I will end up working for. Or where you want your kids to work. I think you mentioned that in the book somewhere. I remember that phrase about where would you want your kids to work. You know, to me, it's a dirty little trick that I pull on clients. Yeah. Especially those with children. But I, I say that with love. When we think about ourselves mm. working in an environment that's perhaps toxic, yeah. We can justify it yes. by saying, well, you know, it's hard work and hard work is important and work is a four-letter word. But when we think about someone that we love, someone who's, as I say, love, safety, belonging become so important to us and we put them in that situation, well, then that changes the tune, doesn't it? One hundred percent. It's like it's like trying to give parents advice about their children. They immediately become defensive because it matters to them. That's right. I think that's a great analogy. But I've never heard anyone ever talk about that. We always talk about building companies for our customers. What about building companies where we would want our grandchildren to work? I love that idea. 
I'm going to use it. I'm taking it. I'm going to copyright it. I'm just telling you. In advance. <laughs> well, there it is. I'm giving away all my trade secrets. <laughs> exactly. No, but, but I love that idea because I'll tell you why it matters to me. One of my underlying concepts is a principle of collective responsibility. We must take care of each other. And I think that, you know, capitalism is wonderful, but there are different forms of capitalism from excessive predatory kind of capitalism where you just don't care about people. You want to do the transaction with them, even if the product doesn't help them, even if it's defective, even if it's poisonous, even if it's going to kill them. On the other end of capitalism, you have a sense of collective responsibility whereby you engage in a transaction because you want the other person to truly be better off. I've never really thought about it, but collective responsibility also means creating a world where not just other people's children will be happy to live because it's a very abstract concept, other people's children, but what about a world or a company where your grandchildren can live in and work? And I mean, that's a very powerful way of framing a problem, right? It is. And I think of the words compassion, mm. which means to be with someone else's suffering, to be with someone else's feeling. I think of the world of the notion of interdependence, which we are all interconnected, mm -hmm. and we're each responsible. And if we were to see, if I were able to see your grandchildren as my grandchildren, even though biologically they're your grandchildren, mm -hmm. it becomes really, really hard to be rapacious, self-optimizing, yes, self-aggrandizing. But when we start to see, you know, I don't speak of this in the book per se, but we start to see that there is no other, there is mm -hmm. only us, it changes the equation of what business should be about. Yeah, it's, and, it's you a, know, the truth is these are not mythological companies. There are companies out there. There are business organizations that actually believe in what you and I are speaking about right now. Live, try to live it every day. They're rare. Yes. But they exist. But let's talk about that point, right? Because Silicon Valley is today, rightly or wrongly, the perception is they are under attack because they are not doing enough things right. Is and I remember the question isn't framed correctly, but is this a way to get them to be more responsible? And it's a very unfair question. I know I'm putting you on the spot. I'm not asking whether you're no, going to coach well, them. Well, let's frame the question. Yeah. How about like this? In what way might it be serving them to act in a way that is, by their own definition, not responsible? I want to be careful about the way I say that. In what way might it be serving or, to put it another way, mm -hmm. what parts of them might be served by acting in a way that is antithetical to the aspirational values that they have? And that's an important framing, because I'm removing right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm using the inquiry process to recognize that even when we act in a bad way, a way that we don't want to act, generally speaking, it's serving some need. And if I, as a leader, would like to change the way I behave, such that, because I want to reduce my suffering and your suffering, such that I don't act in a way that is antithetical to my values, then I need to make sure that that need that I have is met. So, here's an example, a more concrete example of what we're talking about. If we understand that greed, more often than not, is rooted in a false sense of a lack of safety, that again, greed is often rooted in a false sense of a lack of safety. We can understand that greed is a wish to feel safe. I love that. And I never thought about that before. That's a great way right. of framing it. If we can create a sense of safety, hmm. either by removing the false sense of a lack of safety or by truly making something safe for someone, then their need to be greedy be mitigated. The actions won't be greedy. This is almost... Well, not almost, it is touching on behavioral economics. How do you modify behavior by understanding the root cause of the behavior? How do you invent policies, procedures, frameworks, legislation that causes people to change their way they behave by understanding why they behave that way in the first place? But this raises the more important question, right? How do you change a company like, I mean, just using them as an example, I'm not passing judgment on them at all. But how would you change a company like Facebook, a, a gigantic corporation with thousands of employees? I mean, how would this philosophy be able to move them in a different direction if they wanted to do that? It seems like the intervention works if you, someone is lucky enough to work with you. But how do we how do we get the message to a bigger entity? Right. So in response to your question, how do we change it? 
change that, I think of the James Baldwin quote. James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed. Nothing can be transformed, or nothing can be changed until it's faced. But you ask the question, how do you change a company like Facebook? First step is the, this being so. I don't know the, the, the leadership at Facebook mm. and the mm. challenges that they have gone through in the last few years. And we're not judging them. But Just an example. Sense, yeah. But there's a sense that we can sort of see from the outside that seems to be a kind of denial of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Whether it's willful or not, there's a kind of denial that there's a larger responsibility that they seem to have failed. And we can't change that behavior until they begin to acknowledge that that failure has occurred. Mm. The first step is being open to change. The first step is in recognizing that something, that there's a problem. A, uh, cutting through the denial. You work with a lot of leaders. How often are they in denial about having a problem? And it's kind of ironic because denial is such a human trait. We feel we've worked so hard to do something. We've put our blood, sweat, and tears into it. And the first thing we do when we're told something is not right and we need to change is we defend it because we feel that, that we have to protect what we have, not realizing that all of the denial is probably costing us more in the short and even long term. The way you framed greed, I love the way you framed that. It's almost as if denial is, is a protection mechanism rather than arrogance, but it's perceived as arrogance. Oh, it, denial is a protection mechanism. But the rest of the world sees it as Facebook being this arrogant company, but it's really just them hunkering down and trying to survive, right? Right. If I could go for a walk with Mark Zuckerberg, I don't know this for a fact, but the feeling I have is if I could go for a walk with Mark Zuckerberg, it's like shoulder to shoulder say to him, dude, what are you thinking? What kind of world, what do you believe about the world? What kind of world do you want to create? Or where do you want your children to live in, right? Or work with them? What kind of world do you want your children to live in? And what can we do differently? Let's imagine possibilities. Not, not take someone out to the woodshed because they weren't, they didn't act in, in, in a way that mm -hmm. I might have wanted them to act. Ask them to consider their own choices and consequences of their choices. And yeah, I'm not above you, you know, using people's feelings about their children. But I like that because you can't punish someone or scold them into change. I mean, that works, but it's not a sustainable model. And certainly it's not change that's driven from within. But it seems to be that there is a need for that dialogue in Silicon Valley. Well, not everywhere, but at least in a few of those companies. It's not only in Silicon Valley, right? It's in the... Oh, it's everywhere. Wall Street in New York. In every sector, there are companies that truly have, I would say, good leadership who are trying to do well by what they have. And then, you know, it's like a normal distribution. There are quite a few bad apples, quite a few in the middle, and there's some extremely good examples. Well, let's hope Mark Zuckerberg listens to this podcast. I'll send it to him. <laughs> and Cheryl Sandberg. Well, it'll be Cheryl Sandberg because she's the chief operating officer. She kind of does all this work, and then she gives Mark a summary, I think. So we'll send it to Cheryl Sandberg. And we'll see how she does it. Okay, so I have one other, well, I have a couple of other points to raise with you because they were interesting. You made the comment earlier that um, when you ask people to be present, just to be in the moment and think about things, they always talk about the difficulties they have. They always share their stories that are close to their heart that is usually, I won't say traumatic, but it has been a difficult journey for them. If you ever met a client who, when they go through that process, they end up laughing and have just a great story about their lives that they want to share. Oh, is that, has that oh, never happened? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Sure. After that moment of human connection, you share your story, I share my yeah. story, we then look at each other and say, oh my, I know you. Our lives are so different. You grew up in a different country than I did, but our lives are so similar. Then, from that place, you often hear a lot of laughter, a lot of relaxation, a lot of... of a lot, a lot. You know, we're, we're so busy trying to hide who we are that we don't actually create space for the laughter. Think about how we started. We were laughing so much in this call. Yeah, that's true. More laughter than tears, which is a good sign for you, Jerry. Maybe they'll, they'll change more. that stories about you now. That's right. He, he's the, he's the, this man makes founders laugh out loud. <laughs> So what are your plans, Jerry? I mean, you've got this great message. I mean, obviously, you're a good guy. 
what, what do you want to do in the world? I mean, is it just about, and I mean, just not in a negative sense, but is it really about shaping future leaders and current leaders? What, what does Jerry want to do going forward? Well, I feel like I'm the luckiest man on the face of the planet. I'm super proud of the company we've built. You know, just last night, we were out to dinner with some of our colleagues, and we were just doing amazing stuff, of which I had no idea, and it was wonderful. And so as I think about the next 20 years of my life, what I wish is is to continue the work that I'm doing, and uh, hopefully this book will lead to another book and another book. Or I get to joy-filled wish would be 20 years from now, there's five, six books on the shelf. All with pastel colors. <laughs> <laughs> All of which are like uh, are sort of interrelate to one another. And there's a line that we at the company use, taken from one of our inspirations, David White, the poet. And the line is, "Good work done well for the right reasons." I like what I'd like to do what I'd like to do when I go into that long dark night. The bag is over. I just want to be able to lie my head down at night and say, good work, done well, for right reasons. I like it. It's a very peaceful journey. Jerry, thank you so much. I don't want to keep you too long. And, but before I wrap up, no. is there anything you want to add? I mean, I enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to seeing you and Oprah at uh, Super just, Soul I, Sunday. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. It was really a, a delight. And I, want to, I really want to thank you in particular. As you can imagine, I've done a few of these interviews so far, and your connection to the book moves me deeply. I really appreciate that. Well, I must thank you for writing the book. I don't do many of these calls because I feel that you should only talk to someone if you connect with them. Otherwise, it's just a transactional podcast, and nobody wants to listen to those things. Right? It sounds like a corporate podcast. So you wrote the book, and it was good. You don't have to thank me for that because I think that when someone does a good piece of work, everyone wants to talk to them. And I think you're going to see that with this. But I do have one very important question to leave you with. Are you ready for it? I'm ready. In a few weeks, Game of Thrones is going to end. Who do you think is going to win the Iron Throne? <laughs> I mean, you, don't, you may not have a favorite. I'm okay with that. But, but you may have some ideas. Oh, John Snow is going to be sitting on the on the Iron Throne. John Snow. It is. So if you were a betting man, you're going with John Snow. He is the rightful heir. He's the good guy and the rightful heir. And Daenerys is going to have to deal with it. That's it. <laughs> well, Daenerys and, and John Snow could end up getting married, I think. So she could get the Iron Throne through a divorce settlement at some point. Thank you so much, Jerry. <laughs> I had a great time. I really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll be in touch to work on some things you in the do, future. Mike. And that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed doing the episode. Finally, I want you to remember that the only way to get access to our special offers, the only way to get our special pricing, and the only way to get samples of our content is to join the list on firmsconsulting.com. It's the only way also to get access to our unique advanced content that we make available to insiders. So if you want to get a sneak peek of things, test it out, see what's in there, this is the place to go. And finally, I want to thank you again for making us one of the largest podcast channels around the world for careers and for the 2 million downloads and counting.